Hello everybody, good morning. It's about 10 o'clock today, it's a Tuesday morning. We just arrived from Mass, uh, went to Mass at 8 o'clock as we do every morning. And today there was another accident of the Eucharist um, during the distribution of Communion. And you know, these kinds of accidents, I've, I've reported about it many times before because uh, you know, uh, number one, because people don't care anymore when the host or the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ drops to the floor. There was a time when there was a string of these accidents happening almost every day for weeks on end. And I tried to call the attention of the priests, the uh, the sacristans and people attending to the altars to do the right thing uh, first to clean it up properly when there's a mess that is created by such accidents there is a protocol uh, traditionally followed in the church which has been followed ever since of how to clean up after such accidents uh, thankfully our pastor um, asked me to draw up the uh, modus operandi for these kinds of things that I did. I helped him. And for a while, our pastor was doing it religiously. You know, whenever ever there's an accident, he would go himself and, and clean it up because that is what priests do. Uh, it is the priest's primary duty to clean up after any accident in the Eucharist, of the Eucharist. You know, I, I, I compare that to being a parent. You know, <laughs> if you are a parent, and, and your kid uh, messes up anything, spills on the floor or uh, spills anything on the floor or mess, does any accident. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not quite coherent this morning because I am pissed off. I am, I'm very sad, but uh, just bear with me and, and understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, if my own kid messes up in anybody's house, I would feel very personally responsible to clean it up. I would not leave it to any nanny or any babysitter to clean up after the mess of my own children. Now look at this situation. Our Lord is a helpless, helpless uh, 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 victim in the hands of the priests and the lay ministers of Holy Communion to distribute him to us, the faithful. The priest is a parent. It's like a parent having Jesus the helpless Jesus in his hands. Why would anybody in his right mind leave to the nannies at the altar the chore of cleaning up after an accident that involves no less than the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ? But you know what? The priests don't care. They don't care anymore. They leave the nannies to do the job. And don't get me wrong, I'm not using the word nanny here in a derogatory manner. I'm using it to compare uh, the chore of a nanny from that of a parent. I cannot and will not, in conscience, leave the chore of cleaning up my children's accidents or messes to a nanny. I'll do it myself. I am the one personally responsible for whatever my children create. Why can't our priests behave the same way? Why do they just leave that chore to the nanny of the altar? Where is the love of these priests? Where is the faith of these priests? I dare to ask. It's saddening to note, okay? The accident happened, ah, okay, let the nanny take care of it, and he goes his merry way doesn't even come to do any reparation, doesn't even come to show any, any kind of um, <laughs> remorse or, or guilt for, for causing such accidents. And I, I, I blame the priests for accidents to, the, to happen. You know why? You know why? Because for you priests, please be reminded, and you altar servers and sacristans and nannies of the altar, 
please be reminded that the instructions for the Roman Missal, which lays out how Masses are to be said, and the Sacramentarium that uh, Pope Benedict came up with, has very clear instructions that for Holy Communion, okay, there are certain safeguards that we have been following all throughout the centuries in the Church that are put in place in order to precisely safeguard the Eucharist, in order to protect the Eucharist, in order to avoid accidents. And if still accidents happen, then there are ways of dealing with it. <clears throat> so, what is one very, very simple and practical device that is talked about in the instructions of the Roman Missal and the Sacramentarium? It is the use of the communion plate. The communion plate, which is supposed to catch okay, the host or particles or spills of the blood whenever communicants go to receive. If ever there's any of these things that happen to drop off or spill, the communion plate is precisely the tool, the instrument that the church has already thought about to catch whatever fragments fall off from communicants. Why are we not using that in our churches? Why? Is it because of laziness? Or is it because we don't care anymore? It's because we don't regard our Lord anymore with the kind of dignity and importance that He has. That we are so mindless and, 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 and we just we just don't care anymore about how we how we receive our Lord. And I blame the priests and the sacristans for this. All of these accidents that are happening in the church is because of your carelessness. If only you follow the instructions, they're right there. They were written for you to follow. Why aren't you doing it? Why are you just allowing all of these accidents to happen when they are preventable? They are preventable. Why are you allowing them to happen? You see, it's ultimately your fault. You, priests, you, sacristans, it's ultimately your responsibility. The principle of command responsibility is, is what is at play here. Because if you people, you clerics, you sacristans are doing your job, the least you can do is have those communion plates ready for use to at least avoid any more uh, uh, damage or accidents to happen to the sacred body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ in that Eucharist. But no, we have lost our faith. We've lost our love. We've lost any sense of caring for our Lord. You have betrayed him. You, you priests, you sacristans have betrayed our Lord. So how can you, how can you even hope that the faithful would come to receive our Lord properly in Holy Communion if you can't even provide Him any, any kind of protection, any kind of dignity, any kind of reverence with the way you deal with Him. Heck, you can't even genuflect properly, you know? You know how funny it is when you priests or you sacristans uh, 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 try to show any kind of reverence in, even in front of the, the tabernacle. You execute a half jerk of a knee that you don't understand whether you're doing a, a, a dance step or what. Right? Why can't you even genuflect properly? Well, but that's beside the point. I digress and I'm sorry. We're talking about the accidents in the Eucharist. There's no reverence. No more reverence for Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. 
We've done away with the kneelers. We've done away with, you know, we're, we're <laughs> you know, where in St. Joseph's, let's just go back to this. In St. Joseph's, we have three priests, right? Three priests. We have two masses every day, and the priest is supposed to say at least one mass. So let's assume that one priest says mass in the morning, another priest says mass at night. Where is the other priest? I am I am I'm aware that all parishes in Modesto at least are very well staffed with priests. So where's the other one? Why can't the two other priests come out during time of Holy Communion and help distribute Holy Communion? You see, this is part of the abuse that we use this uh, ministers of um, the Eucharist for. We are abusing the use of the ministers. Okay? Because the two other priests, what are they doing? They're there in <laughs> they're there in the uh, in the uh, rectory. Right? Why can't they come out and distribute Holy Communion? We do it during the Latin Mass on Sunday. Why can't we do it every day? You see, where is the faith? Where is the love for our Lord in the Eucharist? If even our priests can't take it upon themselves to minister the Eucharist to us, the faithful. You know what? We, the faithful, do you know what? <laughs> we, we, we have to put up a lot just to be able to attend Mass every day, right? I bring my whole family to Mass every day, every morning, right? We have to wake up early enough to make to make it to the eight o'clock mass we we need to, to to practice one hour of fasting we prepare our souls to receive our lord you know uh, we confession every week by the way for our family why can't our priests <laughs> show a little bit more of effort to match our effort and our desire to receive our Lord very well in, in communion. Why can't our priests match that desire, that fervor, that hunger for our Lord? Why? Why can't you? Why can't you? Where are all of you hiding? When our Lord is being distributed at our altars, where are you hiding? Why can't you come out? Why can't you come out and distribute Holy Communion? Why leave this chore to your nannies? You tell us that there's a scarcity of priests, that's why you use plenty of these nannies at the altar? <laughs> no, we don't have a scarcity of priests, that's a half-truth. Yes, we may. I mean, you know, granted, there are, not enough, there are not too many as we used to have. But you know what is really lacking? It is not so much the number of priests. It is more a lack of faithful priests. Priests who will go out of their way to minister to the faithful, starting from the distribution of Holy Communion. We have lazy priests. We have priests who have no faith anymore in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. We have priests who don't mortify themselves. We have priests who don't understand their ministry. We have priests who are more like entertainers than anything else. Oh, they love to sing. Oh, they love to have microphones at the altar, right? Oh, they love to attend parties of, of people who host parties. Yet, they go and they go on many vacations every year, right? Yet, I challenge you. How many of you sit down in confession for hours on end? Yeah, we're lucky at St. Joseph's. We do that. How many of you priests prepare your homilies? You give us lousy homilies. Do you know that? And I've written about that to many of you. You don't even care to prepare the homilies that you preach at our masses. 
right? You don't even give retreats, recollections, spiritual direction. Where is all of that? Or maybe I shouldn't even be looking for that. If you can't even come out of your comfort zones every morning and every evening to distribute Holy Communion. Maybe I'm expecting too much, right? But I don't think so. I don't think I'm expecting too much. Because I, as a father of seven children, you think I have the luxury for vacations? <laughs> you think I even have the luxury of sleep? I have a nine-month-old baby. You think I can sleep well every night? But I wonder how you priests can sleep when all of these troubles happening to our church is going on around you. How can you have a good sleep at night? How? I'm tired. I mean, having seven kids is a tiring thing to, to do. I mean, but I'm not complaining. I love what I'm doing because that's my vocation. And I've dedicated my life to doing it for my children, for the sake of my children. Well, where are our father priests? Where are you when Jesus needs you? Where are you when Jesus depends on you? We need, to, we need to think about these things, folks. And, and, and for us, you, faithful, who might be listening to me now, don't take this just like another rant. What are you going to do to tell your priests to shape up? Of course, the first thing you need to do is to pray. I tell you, the priests are always the first in our order of intentions for the rosary, for the mass, and for our penance every day. My entire family does that. And I encourage all of you, the faithful, to do the same. But we cannot stop there. We need to talk. We need to express our desires of living the faith better. And for our priests to lead the way. And the Eucharist is where it all begins. You know, it's funny. In St. Joseph's, we proclaim to the world our mission of, and I quote, evangelizing God's people beginning with the gift of the Holy Eucharist. That is our mission at St. Joseph's. Yet, let me enumerate to you the ways that we make a sham out of that mission. Number one, we close the doors of the church. Every day, <laughs> we close the doors of the church and don't allow people to come to visit, visit Jesus at the tabernacle. Yeah, we do that. We require codes for people to enter the church so that they could go to the Adoration Chapel. You see, there's a big mistake there. The Adoration Chapel is a specific kind of um, devotion. Okay? It's not for everybody. What is for everybody is Jesus at the tabernacle of every church. Jesus wanted to remain with us in the form of the host and be preserved in the tabernacle of our churches so that all of us, all the faithful, can go and visit our Lord and pray. But in St. Joseph's, we lock him up. We don't make him available to everybody. Why? Because people are more concerned about security over, <laughs> over the, 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 the facility of making our Lord available for everybody. Security. Personal security. What do you call that? Selfishness. Right? We care more about our personal security rather than the theology the doctrinal and ascetical reasons why our Lord wanted to remain with us in the Holy Eucharist. That is very, very wrong. And in this day and age, folks, who are we fooling? 
in the day and age of security and, 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 and many other devices that we can use uh, to secure the sanctuary of the church? You mean to tell me we cannot do anything about it? You mean to tell me we need to close the doors just to secure our, ourselves, actually. We're not securing our Lord. We're not securing the church. We're securing ourselves, right? Because that's the reason that the administration gives for locking up the church. Security of people. Not even our Lord. See, you, could you imagine that? It's not even for our Lord. It's for the security of people. <laughs> How pathetic can this be? You see, it's, it's, it's a lack of creativity, Lack of creativity for these people in the administration of this church. Lack of creativity. Yet, you know, our neighbors, Fatima, for example, our Lady Fatima, is open the whole day. And tell me about security. Other churches in San Francisco, particularly Star of the Sea, I know that very well because I frequent the church. It's open the whole day. Now come, to, come on. What, do, do you mean to tell me San Francisco is more secure than Modesto? That here we cannot afford to open our doors, yet there they do. Okay, let me tell you some more. How, how, how much of a sham we make of that mission of evangelizing God's people beginning with the gift of the Holy Eucharist. <laughs> the other day I was in the Adoration Chapel because we do that also. We go there before Mass. And you know what? The linen was all crumpled. Could you imagine that? Yeah, that's the kind of love we show our Lord the linen on which he lays is all crumpled. It's a shame. It's a shame. But that's what we do here. What else? Well, uh, yeah, we don't follow the sacramentarium. We don't follow the instructions of the Roman Missal about how we should care for the distribution of our Lord in the species of bread and wine. Many people want to kneel down to receive communion. But then they're, they have issues physically and they're not sure if they can actually execute the motion of kneeling down. And I've asked many times our priests to please provide for these people. But no, no action, nothing doing. Why? But yet we have pews for wheelchairs, we have pews for people with canes, and they're very well labeled. These are for the use of these people. Why can we not facilitate people who want to kneel down and receive our Lord with more reverence? Why can't we do that? Because you don't care. <laughs> because you don't care. Because you... There's no more love for our Lord. Even I... I I don't mean to be uncharitable here. I don't mean to be judgmental. But there's really no other explanation. There is no other explanation. But the lack of faith and lack of love. The lack of faith and the lack of love. That is the only explanation. But you see. Sometimes priests... It's either for their lack of formation or their own problems with faith. They need help. They need help. And they need you and me to help them. Because we enjoy a common priesthood in the church. They're not the only ones who are priests. They are the clerical uh, hierarchy. But you and I enjoy what's called the common priesthood. We we, as St. Paul says, have the care of the churches in our hands too. So when I talk this way, it's not because I know better than you or it's because I, I am self-righteous. No, I am just speaking this way because I am conscious of the fact that I have that awesome obligation to care for the churches of Jesus Christ as part of my baptismal calling as you... Uh, and you have that too. <laughs> so don't think that I am, I am rattling off uh, all of these things just because I'm, I feel like I'm better than you. No, I'm not. I'm just reminding you, we all have this obligation. And that therefore, we have to act on it. It's part of our responsibility to open our mouths and talk and not to keep quiet. 
and not just to be absorbing all the wrong things going on and be victims of the lack of faith of other people in the clergy. We have to talk. We have to express all of these sentiments and speak the truth to these clergy, to our bishops, and to everybody else who cares to listen, who are in administration in our churches. It is our obligation to do that. We're going to have a period of transition. It has been announced in our parish. There's going to be a transition. We're going to have a new pastor. Father Mark is going to be assigned to uh, Stockton. And Father Sam West is coming in. I wish Father Mark all the best as he goes off to his new parish. Father Mark is a very good priest. But I know for a fact he was surrounded by people who gave him difficulty. I know these people. He found it hard to implement many things that he and I have spoken about in the course of his seven years of being in our parish. I was right there in that transition period between Father Joseph Ilo, who was our former pastor, and Father Mark. I was then the chair of the uh, parish council during that transition. And I remember very well that when Bishop Blair, may he rest in peace, sent his emissaries to us in order to ask the parish council about our preferences, I remember very, telling them very clearly, please send us a priest who will respect what we have in St. Joseph's. Namely, what? Adoration, 24-7. Um, uh, uh, confessions every day, the Latin Mass, and a few other things that I rattled off to them. And thankfully, they sent us Father Mark, who indeed uh, respected what we were doing in St. Joseph's, and he did a very good job. But Father Mark, God bless his soul, had his own difficulties of perhaps administering the parish and, and imposing what is right. He found himself between the devil and the deep blue sea, literally. <laughs> so I can't really fault him for many of the things that he wanted to do but couldn't quite do. I just hope that in this transition with Father Sam, we can start to put things right. I hope that you, the faithful of St. Joseph's, can help him. Especially those among you who know what's right and what's not. If you can, we can join forces and, and, and help Father Sam in this transition and, and uh, help him do the right thing, uh, which are many. And uh, if you're interested, you can get in touch with me. You know where to find me. We can talk more about it, and we can perhaps present our proposals to Father Sam. You know, uh, just last week, when I still didn't know that we were going to have a new pastor, I wrote an eight-page letter to Father Mark about the Eucharist. He's already accustomed to me writing him letters, so there's nothing new about me writing an eight-page letter to him. And where I outlined, uh, again, uh, all of the reminders that I've been trying to uh, tell him for these many years, seven years. Uh, but only to realize that, oops, maybe he won't be able to do anything about it because we're going to have a new priest. So, I hope to uh, perhaps give Father Sam that letter. And hopefully, uh, he will be able to implement all of those suggestions if he will be open and welcome those suggestions that I had laid out for Father Mark. But anyway, let us pray for these priests. Let us pray that there will be less accidents for the Eucharist. Let us pray that we all be more careful in receiving our Lord and distributing our Lord. Let's pray that the priests 
realize their ministry and how important it is that they minister first. Okay, sorry. I got interrupted with a phone call that came in. But anyway, let's pray. Okay, I'll end it here because that guy's going to call again. Anyway, have a good day, everybody. Let's pray for our priests. Bye.